Okay, we left off talking about Polycarp of Smyrna. We had before that talked about Clement of Rome. And what we're doing is we are introducing ourselves to some of these early Christian leaders. 2 Timothy 2.2, the verse that we talked about last time, where Paul tells Timothy that the things that you've seen in me in the presence of many witnesses and trust these things to faithful men who will teach others also, that fourfold generation of that model of church leadership is seen in the apostolic level as generation one, the disciples of the apostles, their disciples and their disciples, that there was an intentional infrastructure that was put into the church so that after the apostles laid that foundational stage of church history and then went home to heaven, that the church would continue to flourish under the leadership of elders and deacons in the church. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, church structure in just a moment. But it's really fascinating, I think, to recognize that we know who some of these disciples of the apostles were. Now, certainly we don't know all of their names. A number of their names are mentioned in the New Testament. We have Paul talking frequently about his co-laborers in the gospel ministry. And oftentimes we don't know very much about the names that are listed, except to know that there were people there working alongside the Apostle Paul. But we do have a historical record of some of these individuals outside of the New Testament. Some of their writings have survived. And what makes them so significant to us is that they were so early in the history of the church. These are individuals who knew the apostles and who learned from the apostles firsthand, and I think we have a lot to learn from them. And it's very encouraging and very affirming, at least for me it is, when we see that their interpretations of the apostolic writings and teachings fit our own interpretation of the apostolic writings and teachings. That they understood Paul in the same way that we understand Paul. That they understood the gospel in the same way that we understand the gospel. And even though it's a secondary doctrinal issue, one thing we'll talk about a little bit later today, that they understood, for example, the eschatology of the Apostle John in the same way that we understand the eschatology of the Apostle John. So those are all affirming things for us to consider. They are not authoritative. This is not scripture anymore. This is now church history, and church history is not authoritative. It must be measured against the truth of scripture. But it is very affirming when we see that these men understood the truths of Scripture in the same way that we do. So let's talk a little bit about Ignatius of Antioch. We've talked about Clement of Rome, the disciple of Paul and Peter, author of the Epistle to the Corinthians, where we have one of the clearest statements in early church history of justification by grace through faith apart from any kind of works. We talked about Polycarp of Smyrna, who wrote one existing letter to the Philippians, and also is the subject of one of the earliest accounts of martyrdom in church history, the martyrdom of Polycarp, and we read a little bit of that last time. Ignatius, pastor in the church of Antioch, and this is the same church that Barnabas founded in Acts 11, and that Paul came and co-pastored, and that then sent Paul and Barnabas out as missionaries. According to church tradition, when Peter spent time in Antioch before Peter came to Rome, Peter was the one who installed Ignatius as the pastor of the church in Antioch. He was a disciple of the Apostle John. He was a friend of Polycarp, and we know these things from the letters that they wrote. And he wrote at least seven letters to various churches. Many of these letters were written as he was on his way to be executed in the city of Rome. Ignatius was arrested for being a Christian, and he was taken to Rome where he was killed in the Colosseum as a martyr, probably dying around the year 117, 
The reason for the range of dates here is because it's unclear whether he was killed at the end of Domitian's reign or at the end of Trajan's reign, but most likely the later date is the correct one. Now, when you read in Litvin's book about Ignatius, and you've already read in Olson's book a little bit about Ignatius, you find that he promotes a single bishop form of church government, what we call monopiscopacy. And uh, this was in response to what he viewed as disunity among some of the churches and some of the churches that were in various cities. In order to combat that disunity, Ignatius emphasized that among the elders, among the presbytery, there should be one leader who was kind of the leader among leaders. So among the pastors, there should be one lead pastor. And this lead pastor or lead elder comes to be known by the term bishop later in church history. I want to read a little bit to you out of Nicholas Needham's book, 2,000 Years of Christ's Power, and Michael Beck was talking to me about this on Tuesday. I don't think he's here this morning, but there's a helpful passage, helpful section in this book that I just want to read to you that I think helps clarify some questions that you might have about church government early in church history. So if we switch over and uh, zoom in here. All right, so I'm just going to read about two pages of material here. And I don't normally just read, but I think this is helpful. I think this is going to answer some questions about where did the idea of a bishop come from and what really was this in the early church. So this is Nicholas Needham in his first volume of 2,000 Years of Christ's Power, which, according to Carl Truman, who teaches church history at Westminster, Philadelphia, is one of the best historical theology resources available. And I've interacted with it only a little bit, and yet the parts that I've interacted with have been very good. So, church organization. Needham says this, The main issue the Christian community had to decide in the age of the apostolic fathers was the question of leadership. Who was to govern and guide the churches now that the apostles were all dead? The pattern of church leadership that emerged after the apostolic age was a threefold ministry of bishop, presbyters, and deacons. This took some time to develop itself fully, but by around AD 180, it was universally accepted throughout the church. In the New Testament itself, the words bishop and presbyter do not refer to two distinct offices. They are simply different names for the same office. In the letter of Clement, bishop and presbyter are also identical. That's Clement of Rome. However, in the writings of Ignatius of Antioch, we see these two words being used to refer to distinct offices. Ignatius argued vigorously for a single leader of each church whom he called the bishop, and under the bishop, a team of secondary leaders whom he called presbyters. We might call them elders. And next after them, then, the deacons. Ignatius saw the bishop as the center or focus of unity in the local church. In his letter to Smyrna, he says, Shun divisions as the beginning of evil. Follow your bishop as Jesus Christ followed the Father. And follow your presbyters as the apostles. And respect the deacons as you would respect God's commandment. Let no one do anything in the church apart from the bishop. Holy communion is valid when celebrated by the bishop or by someone the bishop authorizes where the bishop is present There let the congregation gather, just as where Jesus Christ is, there is the church. Needham goes on, It is important for us to understand that the bishops were not seen as new apostles. The early church fathers counted the apostles as unique and constantly referred back to them, quoting their writings and teachings as the final authority. And that's absolutely true. It is true that the early church did not 
did see some of the functions of the apostles continuing in and through the church's bishops, especially the functions of teaching and church discipline. But the bishops were still not apostles in status. They could not claim personal infallibility, proclaim new doctrines, or write new scriptures. And that runs, of course, contrary to the Roman Catholic claim, which sees the Pope as a, essentially, a living apostle. All right. He goes on, Great obscurity veils the way that the threefold ministry of bishop, presbyter, and deacon developed in early church organization. Part of the problem is the confusion that the terms bishop and presbyter can cause. As we have seen, Christians came to apply the title bishop to the single leader of a church and presbyter to the secondary leaders who functioned under him. However, it is still possible that a pattern of one-man leadership existed. He goes on to talk about that. Then he gives an explanation of how this all worked in that bottom paragraph. Originally, the bishop was probably the senior presbyter, the most respected elder who presided over his fellow elders as a first among equals. It is likely that this pattern of leadership was based on the Jewish synagogue, which had a body of elders led by one senior elder, the president or the ruler of the synagogue. The Christian bishop seems to have begun as the president or the presider of the Christian body of elders in each local church. From that position, the status of the president gradually increased in importance throughout the second century. This growth in the president's status was what caused the church to apply the title bishop exclusively to him in distinction from the other elders who were simply called presbyters. And uh, then he goes on to talk about what the bishop did. And we'll look at that a little bit more when we look at the writings of Justin Martyr, because Justin Martyr describes a second century church service for us, and we'll look at that next week. I wanted to read that to you. We'll go back over here to the PowerPoint. But I wanted to read that to you because I think it's helpful for understanding the development of what later becomes the superstructure of groups like the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Orthodox Church. Where did bishops come from? Where did that idea arise in church history? It arose initially from simply the idea that among a group of elders, there would be one leader among the leaders, and that leader would be the primary teacher within the local congregation. That's very similar to a church structure in which you have a board of elders and yet you or a group of pastors, a pastoral staff, and yet you have one pastor who is the lead pastor or the senior pastor. But over time, this will become more and more problematic because that role of bishop will be given greater and greater authority. It will be elevated higher and higher to eventually the point at which you have bishops like the Bishop of Rome who claims to be the vicar of Christ on earth. Okay, so it's, it's a gradual development, but it starts in church history with Ignatius, who's kind of the first one to really promote this idea that there needs to be one main guy at each church, even if there's a body of elders who are supporting him in his leadership role. Ignatius's motivation, again, seems to be for unity in the church. He was attempting to get rid of any cause for disunity or division. And so instead of having a whole group of leaders who are at the top, it's important to have one person who is the leader among those leaders so that there's not disunity or division in the church. That was Ignatius's motivation, it seems, for promoting this monopiscopacy, as we call it. Ignatius is also one of the first in church history to articulate what we see as a biblical concept that the Lord's Day on Sunday had replaced the Sabbath day. So we see that in the book of Acts. We see the disciples meeting together, in some cases every day of the week, but primarily on the day on which Jesus rose from the dead. We see that taught then and articulated in church history, starting with Ignatius. It'll be reiterated many times by men like Justin Martyr and others. Okay, there's Antioch. We have Clement over in Rome, and we have Polycarp in Smyrna, and then over on the far right, far 
east of our map, we have Ignatius in Antioch, and all three men are contemporaries. Now, they didn't all die at the same time. Clement died in the late 90s, around 100. Ignatius died around 115, and Polycarp didn't uh, go home to heaven until probably around 155. So let's read a little bit from one of his letters. This is Ignatius's letter to the Magnesians, which I think I picked this one just because Magnesian is a very fun word to say. But uh, it does have some really helpful insights here into the life of the early church. So starting in paragraph 9 here, or chapter 9 of this letter, Consequently, if the people who were given to obsolete practices, which is a reference to the Judaizers and those who were trying to keep the Mosaic law, if they face the hope of a new life, and if these no longer observe the Sabbath, but regulate their calendar by the Lord's day, the day too on which our life rose by his power and through the medium of his death, though some deny this, and if to this mystery we owe our faith and because of it submit to sufferings to prove ourselves disciples of Jesus Christ, our only teacher, how then can we possibly live apart from him? In other words, we can't be saved by keeping the law, and so there must be a transition that takes place when we embrace Christ. Unlike the Jews of the Old Testament, Christians worship Christ on Sunday, the Lord's Day, not on the Sabbath. So there's a break with the Mosaic law, and it's seen in the rejection of Sabbath keeping and the worship of God on Sunday. Number 10 here, let us not then be insensible to his loving kindness. Certainly, if we were to imitate, excuse me, if he were to imitate our way of acting, we should be done for instantly. In other words, if God imitated us, we would all be doomed. But we must prove ourselves his disciples. We need to imitate him and learn to live like Christians. Assuredly, whoever is called by a name other than this is not of God. He goes on, now this, dearly beloved, I do not write as though I had learned that any of you were men of that description, but because as one who is not your superior, I merely wish to warn you not to yield to the bait of false doctrine, but to believe most steadfastly in the birth, the passion, and the resurrection which took place during the procuratorship of Pontius Pilate. Facts these are, real and established by Jesus Christ our hope. May God grant that none of you may relinquish that hope. Uh, pause there for a moment. Um, this is one of the early Christian testimonies to the facts of the crucifix crucifixion and resurrection. And there are, of course, as you would expect, many such testimonies. If you're looking for a resource that documents all of the early Christian and non-Christian testimony to the death of burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, Gary Habermas from Liberty has written a book. I think it's called Historical Evidence for the Resurrection. Um, that title might not quite be right, but he goes through and documents over 40 different early accounts that prove, from a historical standpoint, the historical factualness of the gospel accounts. Gary Habermas, it's H-A-B-E-R-M-A-S. Number 13, be zealous, therefore, to stand squarely on the decrees of the Lord and the apostles, that in all things whatsoever you may prosper in body and in soul and faith and in love in the Son and the Father and the Spirit in the beginning and the end. Love that Trinitarian reference there. Together with your most reverend bishop, and with your presbytery, here we have that twofold leadership structure, that fittingly woven spiritual crown, and with your deacons, men of God, submit to the bishop and to each other's rights, just as Jesus Christ in the flesh to the Father, and as the apostles did to Christ and the Father and the Spirit, so that there may be oneness both of flesh and of spirit. So there you have that threefold structure mentioned, the bishop, the elder board, and the deacons. The senior pastor, the elders, and the deacons. If I can use contemporary terminology, sometimes it's helpful because these terms become so 
so shrouded in tradition and so connected to Roman Catholicism or Greek Orthodoxy that sometimes it's helpful to use contemporary evangelical terms so that it gets rid of the baggage in your mind. Yeah, Brian. I usually be getting into um, how Lippin talks about the Catholic Church and then the Roman Catholic Church and separates that. You're going to be talking about that. You know, that's a, a really good question. It is something that I always try and mention. I think I have it articulated in the notes at some point. Uh, Brian's asking about the term Catholic. In the same way that the term Orthodox gets hijacked by the Greek Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox Church, Orthodox just means to have that, to believe that which is true. It, it, it actually means to have straight doctrine. But it means to believe that which is true, that which is in keeping with what the apostles and with what Christ taught. So the term orthodox itself means straight. Is your doctrine straight? Is it true? Is it orthodox? Eastern orthodoxy hijacked that term and applied it to its denomination, I suppose, if, if I can use that term really loosely. The term Catholicism. Uh, Catholic is a term that actually means universal. And so when we use the term Catholic, lowercase c, we are referring to the universal, invisible church. The church fathers use the term Catholic a lot, just like they use the term Orthodox a lot, because they believed that they were part of the universal church and that their doctrine was straight and true. That's all they meant by those terms. It is later that Roman Catholicism hijacks the term Catholic and becomes starts to refer to themselves essentially as the universal church of Rome. And so they become the, the Roman universal church. In the same way that the Mormon church you know, they refer to themselves as the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints. If you just take all those words together and demormonize them, any true church could refer to itself as a church of the Lord Jesus Christ, of believers who are living in the last days. But the term has been hijacked by the Mormon church. Roman Catholicism hijacked the term Catholic Eastern Orthodoxy hijacked the term Orthodox. So I have no problem when people refer to evangelical Christians as being Catholic if they're referring to it in the lowercase c universal church sense. However, the term has now become so filled with Roman Catholic baggage that it's usually not helpful to speak in those terms. Okay? This is an important point when you talk to Catholics, because when I've talked to Catholics about early church history, they will give me a whole slew of quotes from church fathers who use the term Catholic. And they say, look, see, so-and-so referred to the Catholic church. He was Catholic. Well, he meant that in the sense, the general sense of the universal church. Roman Catholic was not what he was thinking about. It's an important caveat. So good question, Brian. Okay, number 14 here. Knowing that you are steeped in God, I am exhorting you, but briefly remember me in your prayers that I may happily make my way to God. He's on his way to be martyred here. Remember too the church in Syria of which I am an unworthy member. Yes, I do stand in need of your God-inspired prayer and your love. The church in Syria will be privileged through your church to be quickened with refreshing dew. And then number 15, the Ephesians at Smyrna, the place from which I am writing to you, send their greetings. So he's actually writing this letter while he's in Smyrna. Well, who's there with them? Like yourselves, they have come here for the glory of God. They have revived my spirits in every way, as does Polycarp, the guy we just met. So he's actually spending time with Polycarp as he writes this letter, even though he is on his way to Rome, where he will be executed. The rest of the churches, too, beg to be remembered in honor of Jesus Christ. Farewell, you who, being of one mind with God, possess an unflinching spirit, which is to be like Jesus Christ. So there you go. There's a little taste of Ignatius's writings. We do see some of the doctrinal 
uh, teachings that he uniquely articulates, in particular that monopiscopacy, which is just taking the word episcopacy and then putting mono in front of it. So one bishop, that's what that means. At this point in church history, the one bishop model is not a problem. It will become a problem later in church history. That happens a lot. You get someone introducing a concept that is more or less benign at the time that it's introduced, and it's only later that that leads to serious error. We'll give you some examples of those as we get later into the class. Yeah, Josh. So in reading, I got the impression that was he referring to one bishop over one church or a bishop over the churches in the city? At this time in church history, there are not many cities that have more than one church. So practically speaking, it's going to be one bishop over a city because for most cities, there's only one church within the city. Uh, so the way it works itself out seems to be that there was one bishop over a city or a region. And uh, that certainly is how it plays itself out later in church history, that each city then has one bishop, even when we get to points in church history where there will be multiple congregations within the city, each of whom have their own elders, and among those elders there's teachers, and yet there will be one bishop who's kind of over all of the churches. But I think that's a more developed state of the church infrastructure that I'm not entirely sure Ignatius had en envisioned when he promoted this view. So it develops into that for sure. Yep? Um, back in paragraph 9, you made reference to really the Lord's Day replacing the Sabbath. Yes. And, and I've heard conflicting reports of people saying that church history shows that the Sabbath day was actually always there. It was the Roman Catholic Church that had replaced it. This letter seems to indicate the opposite. Were, were there uh, conflicting views amongst believers at that time on which day to, to worship? Not to my knowledge. Uh, the reading that I've done on it seems to indicate that the early church was pretty much unanimous in affirming Sunday as the primary day of worship, even though believers would often meet on other days of the week. And there, there really is a pretty quick separation between Christians and the Jews. The Christians want to separate Christianity from Judaism. That becomes more and more marked as we get into church history. Uh, it especially comes up with regard to the date of Easter, which we'll talk about a little bit later, because technically Easter should be celebrated on the same day as Passover. But we don't celebrate it on the same day as Passover. Why not? Because Christians didn't want to share that holiday with Judaism. They wanted to distinguish Christianity from Judaism. So among some of the Judaizers and the Ebionites, perhaps there was still Sabbatarianism, but for Christians, it was a replacement of the Sabbath with the Lord's Day. Now, when we get into the Puritan literature a long time later, suddenly the Lord's Day becomes the Christian Sabbath, and you have a whole different discussion. But at this point, I think it's pretty unanimous that the early church met on Sunday. And Justin Martyr, in his uh, uh, recounting of a second century church service, makes that explicit. Good question, though. Okay, here we have then the martyrdom of Ignatius, who was killed by wild animals there in the Colosseum. And since Dr. Farnell often refers to the movie Gladiator, if and when you ever watch the movie Gladiator, there is in the deleted scenes a scene in which Christians are killed in the Colosseum. The director did not include it in the final cut of the film, but it is in the deleted scenes. It certainly was a part of what was happening. Uh, that particular episode is under Emperor Marcus Aurelius, and he was one of the emperors who persecuted Christianity. In fact, he's the one uh, who executed Justin Martyr. But anyway, not to bring Russell Crowe into church history, but <laughs> since Dr. Farnell set the precedent, I can't help myself. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Papias of Hierapolis. Hierapolis. 
we honestly don't know very much about Papias of Herapolis, and that's because he wrote a five-volume treatise on his interpretations of the sayings of the Lord, which would be really a wonderful thing to discover, but it has been lost. We know that it existed because Irenaeus refers to it and Eusebius refers to it. And in fact, they both quote from sections of it. So we do have some snippets of Papias's writings. And yet the full treatise that he produced has not survived. Among the important historical information that Papias gives us, Papias is one of the early testimonies to the fact that John Mark, the author of the Gospel of Mark, was actually writing down the sermons of Peter, and so technically the Gospel of Mark is the Gospel of Peter as written down by Mark. And that was probably written down while Mark was in Rome, when Peter was in Rome, before Peter was arrested and crucified. Papias also suggests that Matthew wrote a version of his gospel in Hebrew, which most scholars believe would have been Aramaic. We know that the purpose of Matthew's gospel was as a treatise to the Jews to demonstrate that Christ was indeed the king of the Jews. And scholars go back and forth debating whether or not there was an Aramaic version of the gospel of Matthew that was then uh, reproduced as a Greek version and I'll let uh, Dr. Farnell get into that with you when you get to New Testament introduction, or Dr. Osborne, whoever you have. The important thing, of course, from a canonical standpoint is to recognize that God in his providence chose to inspire and preserve the Greek version of Matthew. So uh, whether or not there was an Aramaic version ultimately is not all that important, but it's kind of an interesting note from history. Uh, Eusebius, who was the 4th century church historian, was very much an amillennialist. We'll take a little bit of time later in this class to discuss the uh, development of amillennialism during these early centuries. But as an amillennialist, Eusebius did not have a lot of tolerance for earlier church fathers who were premillennialists. And so he referred to Papias as a man of small mental capacity because... He believed in a literal millennial kingdom. So the eschatological trash talking between premillennialists and amillennialists has a long history. And uh, we know that he was a hearer of the Apostle John, a companion of Polycarp, and a man of old time, and that comes from Irenaeus. Irenaeus himself, a disciple of Polycarp. Yep. It's just, Irenaeus is, Papias is a companion and um, contemporary of Polycarp. Irenaeus is the disciple of Polycarp. So Irenaeus is simply looking back in history at his vantage point, which at that point, Irenaeus died around 200. So we, we only have about a century and a half of church history. But he's looking back and saying, this man is a man of antiquity in the sense of, uh, having lived a long time ago at the earliest stages of church history. So there you can see Hierapolis right there near Smyrna, right near Ephesus, and uh, a place in the region of Asia Minor. Papias, again, this makes sense, a disciple of the Apostle John. All right, let's read just a couple of sections from Papias' writings. And again, these are recorded for us in the writings of Irenaeus and also the writings of Eusebius. He says, I will not hesitate to add also for you to my interpretations what I formerly learned with care from the presbyters. He's actually using that term as a reference to the apostles. You'll see that in a moment. And have carefully stored in memory, giving assurance of its truth. For I did not take pleasure, as the many do, in those who speak much, but in those who teach what is true, nor in those who relate foreign precepts, but in those who relate the precepts which were given by the Lord to the faith and came down from the truth itself. I would inquire, and, uh, excuse me, and also, I lost my place there. 
And also, if any follower of the presbyters happened to come, I would inquire for the sayings of the presbyters. What Andrew said, or what Peter said, or what Philip, or what Thomas, or James, or what John, or Matthew, or any other of the Lord's disciples, and for the things which Aristion and the presbyter John, the disciples of the Lord, were saying. For I considered that I should not get so much advantage from the matter in books as from the voice which yet lives and remains. So you can see here from Papias' own testimony that his information, and again, most of it is lost, but his information came directly from the apostles, and in particular, the apostle John. Now, on the writings of the Gospels, Papias says this, Mark, having become the interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately whatsoever he remembered. It was not, however, in exact order that he related the sayings or deeds of Christ, for he neither heard the Lord nor accompanied him, but afterwards, as I said, he accompanied Peter, who accommodated his instructions to the necessities of his hearers, but with no intention of giving a regular narrative of the Lord's sayings. In other words, Peter preached what happened uh, through, from his own eyewitness testimony to the gospel, and Mark wrote it down. Wherefore, Mark made no mistake in thus writing some things as he remembered them, for of one thing he took special care, not to omit anything he had heard, or not to put anything fictitious into the statements. Matthew put together the oracles of the Lord in the Hebrew language, and each one interpreted them as best he could. So there you have the statements backing up what I mentioned earlier about Papias' take on two of our four Gospels. And then finally, on the issue of premillennialism, here's Eusebius commenting on this man of small mental capacity, as he's already called him in the context. He says this, "...the same person, moreover, has set down other things as coming to him from unwritten tradition." Among these, some strange parables and instructions of the Savior and some other things of a more fabulous nature. Among these, he says that there will be a millennium after the resurrection from the dead when the personal reign of Christ will be established on the earth. So there you go. Here's Papias, a hearer of the apostles themselves, a disciple really of the apostle John, a friend of Polycarp, who was also a disciple of the Apostle John, and Papias clearly teaches that there will be a millennial kingdom after the return of Christ. Uh, Irenaeus also records some of Papias' teachings, and he is equally, if not more, explicit in recording Papias' premillennialism. Yep? Not that we know of. Were there any contemporaries who, um, yeah, were there any contemporaries who disagreed with the premillennial position? The answer is not that we have any record of. So every early church leader up until at least the middle of the third century with Clement of Alexandria that we have an eschatological record of their views, a record of their eschatological views, is a better way to say it, they were all premillennialists. There is, in Justin Martyr's account of his own premillennialism, a statement where he says that not everyone is of this same opinion. So there is, and amillennialists like to pour their amillennialism into that statement. Justin Martyr doesn't clarify what he means. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the people he's referring to were amillennial, but he does say that there are other people of a different opinion. What that opinion specifically was, he doesn't articulate. So th the only possible crack in the door for amillennialism is Justin Martyr saying, hey, I'm a premillennialist, but not everyone is of the same opinion in the specifics of how I interpret my eschatology. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I've mentioned Papias and uh, Justin Martyr, but 
to their names we could add a couple dozen other church fathers who all articulated premillennial views. So we'll spend more time talking about the development of eschatology in this class. I think it's a fascinating study, and um, it really does put the onus on amillennialists to defend their position, because we can demonstrate that those who knew the apostles, the first several generations of church leaders, interpreted apostolic teaching in a premillennial way, universally. All right, so here we have these early Christian writers, and we're going to look a little bit more at some of the anonymous writings in just a moment. But we had Clement in Rome, we have Polycarp in Smyrna, Papias in Herapolis, Ignatius in Antioch, and then some of the documents we haven't talked about yet, the Shepherd of Hermas, probably written in Rome from around the mid-2nd century, the Epistle of Barnabas, written in the early 2nd century from Alexandria, Egypt, the Didache written maybe around 100, we don't know exactly when it was written, but somewhere in Syria, and then also, oh, that's all of them, I think I got all of them there. So here we have our early Christian leaders, our early church fathers, uh, the anonymous epistle to Diognetus, I don't think we know where that was written from, which is why it's not included here on the map. But you can see, uh, as I mentioned here on the PowerPoint, the influence of the apostles' ministry in the geographical placement of these fathers because you have the disciples of John there in Asia Minor where John ended his ministry, the influence of Barnabas and Paul and even Peter in Antioch with Ignatius, and of course the influence of Peter and Paul in Rome with Clement, and uh, possibly... Mark's influence in Alexandria, Egypt, since according to church tradition, he planted the church in Alexandria. A timeline of these events from Pentecost to 100 years later, you can see how these early Christian leaders overlap with the apostles, why we call them the apostolic fathers. So Clement, his ministry overlaps with John's ministry Papias, Polycarp, Ignatius, influenced by John as well towards the end of the first century. And um, these men, again, there was very much a network of Christian leaders at this time. These men would have known not only the apostles, but the associates of the apostles. And um, unfortunately, we don't know more about them just because the history is a bit scant in places. All right, some other early Christian writings, The Shepherd of Hermas, written in Rome in the mid-2nd century. Some scholars categorize it with the apocalypses of New Testament apocrypha because it is apocalyptic in style and full of allegory and symbolism. I think the best way to think about The Shepherd of Hermas is to, uh, is to put it in the same category as Pilgrim's Progress. And uh, you'll see what I mean when we read from it in just a moment. But Pilgrim's Progress is a book that we all understand is allegorical, and we interpret it as being helpful and beneficial in the sense of being an allegory. If you understand The Shepherd of Hermas from that same perspective, then I think you can appreciate it rather than just dismissing it as being bizarre. The Epistle of Barnabas, written around 130, not written by the New Testament Barnabas, It is allegorical. It introduces into church history an allegorical method of interpretation that will become important, especially in Alexandria, Egypt, where the allegorical school of hermeneutics will come to dominate and where Clement of Alexandria and eventually Origen will popularize that allegorical school of interpretation. The Didache, or the teaching of the Twelve Apostles, an early work dating from between 80 and 160, along with First Clement, very important early church document. And I've already mentioned in this class, but if you're interested in the Didache, you should pick up Dr. William Varner's commentary on the Didache, which helps explain what's going on from a distinctly evangelical perspective. So let's read a little bit from the Shepherd of Hermas. Again, think Pilgrim's Progress. 
20 days after the former vision, I saw another vision. As I walked alone, I prayed the Lord to complete the revelations which he had made to me through his holy church, that he might strengthen me and give repentance to all his servants who were going astray, that his great and glorious name might be glorified because he promised to show me his marvels. While I was glorifying him and giving him thanks, a voice, as it were, answered me, Doubt not, Hermas. And I began to think with myself and to say, what reason have I to doubt, I who have, se- have been established by the Lord and who have seen such glorious sights? I advanced a little, brethren, and lo, behold, I saw dust rising even to the heavens. I saw a mighty beast like a whale, and out of its mouth fiery locusts proceeded. But the size of that beast was about a hundred feet, and it had a head like an urn. I began to weep and to call on the Lord to rescue me from it. Then I remembered the word which I had heard, Doubt not, O Hermas." Clothed, therefore, my brethren, with faith in the Lord and remembering the great things which he had taught me, I boldly faced the beast. Now that beast came on with such noise and force that it could itself have destroyed a city. I came near it, and the monstrous beast stretched itself out on the ground and showed nothing but its tongue and did not stir at all until I had passed by it. Now the beast had four colors on its head, black, then fiery and bloody, then golden, and lastly white. Now, after I had passed by the wild beast and had moved forward about 30 feet, behold, a virgin met me and adorned adorned as if she were proceeding from the bridal chamber, clothed entirely in white and with white sandals and veiled up to her forehead, and her head was covered by a hood. She had white hair. I knew from my former visions that this was the church, and I became more joyful. She saluted me and said, Hail, O man, and I returned her salutation and said, Lady, hail. And she answered and said to me, Has nothing crossed your path? I said, I was met by a beast of such a size that it could destroy peoples, but through the power of the Lord and his great mercy, I escaped from it. Well, did you escape from it, she said, because you cast your care on God and opened your heart to the Lord, believing that you can be saved by no other than his great and glorious name. On this account, the Lord has sent his angel and has shut up its mouth so that it cannot tear you. You have escaped from great tribulation on account of your faith and because you did not doubt in the presence of such a beast. Go, therefore, and tell the elect of the Lord his mighty deeds, and say to them that this beast is a type of the great tribulation that is coming. If then you prepare yourselves and repent with all your heart and turn to the Lord, it will be possible for you to escape it if your heart be pure and spotless and you spend the rest of the days of your life serving the Lord blamelessly. Cast your cares on the Lord, and he will direct them. Trust the Lord, you who doubt, for he is all-powerful. But woe to those who hear these words and despise them, Better were it for them not to have been born. So there you go. It's this vision of this monster that attacks Hermas, and he escapes seemingly miraculously. And then he interprets this vision by telling us that that beast represents persecution and that the church might escape or at least endure persecution if they cast their care on the Lord and live for him. So I think you can see maybe parallels between something like that and Pilgrim's Progress. For me, at least, it helps me appreciate what Hermas is doing uh, rather than trying to figure out exactly, (laughs) uh, rather than approaching it from a non-allegorical approach. All right, the epistle of... Barnabas. Uh, You can see how the shepherd of Hermas would have been especially encouraging to uh, Christians at a time when persecution within the Roman Empire was severe. And his way of presenting these images would have emboldened and encouraged them to indeed remain steadfast in the midst of ongoing persecution. And we'll talk more about the persecution later in this class. The epistle of Barnabas. Here Barnabas is going to demonstrate the fact that he believes that the church has replaced Israel. The idea of replacement theology, what we call supersessionism, this idea that Israel has been replaced by the church or that the church is the new Israel, that starts to gain a foothold early in church history. And Barnabas, writing from Alexandria, Egypt, using an allegorical hermeneutic, is one of the first to present this replacement theology. 
Now, interestingly enough, Barnabas is a premillennialist, but he's a premillennialist who is advocating a replacement theology, and that replacement theology will become one of the touchstone principles in amillennialism. So there's a little bit of a development going on here. But in this section, he's just simply showing us that the things that took place for Old Testament Israel, those are now, those now apply to the church. So here in chapter 2, he has made manifest to us by all the prophets that he wants neither sacrifices nor whole burnt offerings. Quotes then from the Old Testament. These things, therefore, he annulled. So the Old Testament is gone, that the new law of our Lord Jesus Christ, being free from the yoke of constraint, might have its oblation not made by human hands. Quotes again from the Old Testament. Section 9 here, So we ought to perceive, unless we are without understanding, the mind of the goodness of our Father, for he speaks to us, desiring us not to go astray like the Israelites, but to seek how we may approach him. Thus then he speaks to us, The sacrifice unto God is a broken heart. The smell of a sweet savor unto the Lord is a heart that glorifies its maker. We ought therefore, brethren, to learn accurately concerning our salvation, lest the evil one, having effected an entrance of error in us, should fling us away from our life. To this end, therefore, brethren, skipping to chapter 3, paragraph 6, he that is long-suffering, foreseeing that the people whom he had prepared in his well-being, well-beloved, would believe in simplicity, manifested to us beforehand concerning all things, that we might not as novices shipwreck ourselves upon their law. So you can see the, the distancing that's taking place between the church and Israel, between the law of Christ and the law of Moses. Then the Didache, and we are admittedly going quickly through these writings, but I think it's important to expose you to what was said in some of these documents. The Didache begins with a section that differentiates between the way of wisdom and the way of folly, the way of life and the way of death. And we see this throughout the scriptures in the book of Proverbs, and other places, even in the Sermon on the Mount, we have this broad way that leads to destruction and the narrow path that leads to life. And you see that represented here in the Didache. The Didache means the Twelve, or the teachings of the Twelve. And it's a reference to the teachings of the Twelve Apostles. This document claims to be essentially a summary and a synthesis of apostolic teaching after this introductory section on the two ways, it will give specific application for baptismal candidates on how they are to be entered into the church and on some of the other aspects of church life. But this opening section is really interesting. There are two paths, one of life and one of death, and the difference is great between the two paths. The path of life is this. First, you shall love the God who made you, your neighbor as yourself, and all things that you would not want done to you, do not do unto another. And the doctrine of these maxims is as follows. Bless them that curse you, pray for your enemies, fast on behalf of those who persecute you. For what reward is there if you love them that love you? Do not even the Gentiles do the same, but love them that hate you, and you will not have an enemy. Does this sound familiar? It sounds a lot like the Sermon on the Mount. Abstain from fleshly and worldly lusts. If anyone gives you a blow on your right cheek, turn unto him the other also, and you shall be perfect. If anyone compels you to go a mile, go with him too. If a man takes away your cloak, give him your coat also. Number five, give to everyone that asks of you, and ask not again. For the Father wishes that from his own gifts there should be given to all. Blessed is he who gives according to the commandment, for he is free from guilt. But woe unto him that receives. For if a man receives while being in need, he shall be free from guilt. But he who receives when not in need shall pay a penalty as to why he received and for what purpose. And when he is in tribulation, he shall be examined concerning the things that he has done and shall not depart from there until he has paid the last farthing. It's just a way of reiterating Christ's teaching in the Sermon on the Mount on not being greedy or hoarding, but giving to others out of a heart of generosity. For of a truth it has been said on these matters, let your almsgiving abide in your hands until you know to whom you have Given. In other words, don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. A reiteration again of another principle from the Sermon on the Mount. The second commandment is this. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not corrupt youth. You shall not commit fornication. You shall not steal. 
taking the Ten Commandments in the same way that Christ did and boiling them down to two great commandments, love the Lord your God, love your neighbor as yourself, and then applying those in church life. Uh, One thing here that you need to see in paragraph two, this is important. You shall not commit fornication, you shall not steal, you shall not use soothsaying, you shall not practice sorcery, and this. You shall not kill a child by abortion, neither shall you slay it when it is born. You shall not covet the goods of your neighbor. So here we have, in very early Christian history, an application of the command not to murder two unborn children. So for those, for people in uh, American society today who claim that Christianity's anti-abortion stance is simply a product of the moral majority of the 1960s and 70s, that is not the case. All the way back in the Didache, perhaps written still in the first century, we have an explicit application of the command not to murder applied to unborn babies and also to newborn babies. Since in the Roman Empire, both abortion and infanticide were practiced with unwanted children. Uh, And then he goes on to, again, apply some of these commands from the Sermon on the Mount to the Christian congregation. All right, that takes us then to the end of the PowerPoint. And coming back to our teaching notes... In the, in the few minutes that remain, I just want to spend a little bit of time looking at this addendum that I have starting on page 47. We have about 10 minutes left, and I wish we had more than 10 minutes to talk about this subject because it's a really important subject. I say that about everything we talk about in this class, but I feel that way about everything we talk about in this class. This class focuses on the history of Christianity primarily within the boundaries of the Roman Empire. But it would be incomplete for you to think that Christianity only existed within the Roman Empire or that the history of the Christian church is synonymous with or constrained to the parameters of the development and history of the Roman Empire itself. There has been a lot of really good historical work that has been done, especially in the last two decades, on the spread of Christianity outside of the Roman Empire within these early centuries. Now, we focus on the Roman Empire for two reasons. One, the Apostle Paul, his ministry was within the Roman Empire. That's what's recorded in the book of Acts. So that's what we generally focus on when we look at early Christian history. Peter and John also stayed within the Roman Empire. That, I mean, Christ ministered within the boundaries of the Roman Empire, so it did start there. Second reason is that as those who are part of a Western civilization, our own history is really the history of the Roman Empire because the Roman Empire becomes the foundation for Western Europe and Western Europe becomes the foundation for the United States of America. So, We have a lot more information about the history of Christianity within the Roman Empire. But I want to expand your horizons just a little bit for a few minutes as we end class today. Christianity in these early centuries, the Great Commission is to take the gospel to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. There is nothing in the Great Commission about stopping when you get to the borders of the Roman Empire. And you'll be encouraged to know that the gospel spread across the entirety of the known world. It was not constrained to the Roman Empire itself. So Christianity spread southwest to Africa. Of course, the Roman Empire encompasses all of northern Africa at this time. And yet we have, even in the book of Acts, an Ethiopian eunuch who takes the gospel down to Ethiopia. Ethiopia becomes very early on, before the Roman Empire becomes Christian, Ethiopia becomes a Christian nation. In North Africa, Christianity flourishes along the Mediterranean coast. 
two of the most influential leaders in fourth century Christianity are native Africans, Athanasius and Augustine. And we'll talk about both of those men when we get a little bit later in the class. In Egypt, Christianity flourished until, of course, the rise of Islam. But there is still an Egyptian Coptic church that traces its history all the way back to those early centuries. In Nubia, which is the modern-day Sudan, Christianity was introduced by Christian monks and traders in at least the 5th and 6th centuries, maybe even earlier. As a result, Nubia for a short time became a Christian nation. In Ethiopia, in modern-day Ethiopia, the rulers converted to Christianity in the 4th century. And, of course, we know that the gospel was brought there by the Ethiopian eunuch already in the 1st century. So there was a gospel witness there. And um, uh, there is still uh, an, e an Ethiopian apostolic church. Now, it's been shrouded in tradition, much like the Roman Catholic Church, but it traces its history, nonetheless, all the way back to those early years. And uh, it's likely that from Ethiopia and from the Sudan that missionaries even went further south into the heart of Africa, even though we don't have much historical record of all of the missionary activity that occurred then. To the east, in Asia, Christianity, of course, began in the Middle East, but it spread east from there. The gospel went to Syria and to Turkey, Asia Minor, to Armenia, the first country in the world to convert to Christianity in an official sense. Georgia, the Parthian and Sassanid Empire, which is modern-day Iran and Iraq. In fact, um, historians believe that there were as many as, or more than, 100,000 Christians in modern-day Iran and Iraq uh, in the 4th and 5th century AD, that there were many, many Christians. The, the national religion of the Parthenid and Sassanid empires was Zoroastrianism, but Christianity quickly gained a foothold in those countries, and there are still Christians in those countries today who trace their heritage all the way back to these early centuries. There were Christians in Central Asia, Afghanistan, Pakistan, to use modern geographical terms, Bactria, to use an ancient term. Thomas, the apostle, took the gospel to India. A church in Persia arose, known as the Assyrian Church, and they sent missionaries east to the Mongols, to the Hephthalites, and eventually to China. And we know that perhaps as early as the 400s, but certainly by the 7th, 8th century, there was a significant Christian population in China. And there are archaeological, um, archaeological uh, discoveries that have been made that prove that, especially in the Tang Dynasty, Christianity flourished in China. We know that Christian missionaries went to Japan. We know that there were Christians in the court of Genghis Khan, for example. So I just want to expand your horizons a little bit that you don't think that Christianity was just this localized regional Roman religion that finally hit the international scene, so to speak, at the, you know, when the modern missions movement was born. Long before the modern missions movement of William Carey and others, Hudson Taylor, the gospel went to India, the gospel went to China, the gospel went south into Africa, and the gospel, of course, went north into Europe. And we'll spend more of our time in this class focusing on that aspect of the spread of Christianity. But it would be wrong for you to think that the Great Commission was not being intentionally uh, sought after by these early generations of Christians. They were seeking to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. And by the 5th, 6th, 7th century AD, the gospel literally had gone to the ends of the known world. As far east as you can go in Asia, as far south as they could go in Africa at that time, and as far north as you could go in Europe. So what's kind of scary when you consider some of this, though, is to recognize that today the part of the world that is most hostile to Christianity, what we consider the 1040 window of modern missions, was 1,500, 1,600 years ago, the Bible Belt of Christianity. So 
Uh, much of this will get wiped out, not completely, but certainly eclipsed by Islam when Islam comes on the scene in the 7th century A.D. But I, I don't want you to think of the Great Commission as something that the church never was able to uh, try and fulfill, maybe not in a complete sense, but certainly uh, attempt to fulfill until modern times. That's simply not accurate. The gospel spread across the face of the known world in these early centuries A.D. Unfortunately, in this class, we don't have a lot of opportunity to talk about all of that, but this makes a great topic for your project if you're particularly interested, for example, in the spread of Christianity in Africa or East in Asia or even North into Europe. It's a fascinating study. And as I mentioned, there are a number of good books. I only have four of them listed here. But there are a number of really good books that have been done in the last two decades on this topic as scholars have come to realize that Christianity was much broader than the Roman Empire.